Galloway's support through sight loss. Galloway's Get Active presents Simon Wheatcroft, Ultra Runner. So Simon is uh, an ultra marathon runner and started losing your sight early on in life. And from there you sort of took up running and got to where you are now with developing different tech and stuff like that as well. So yep. over to Simon to give us a, a bit of background about himself. Okay, so hi everybody. Yeah, my name's Simon. Um, I actually have retinitis pigmentosa, which some of you may know is so uh, born with sight and then as I aged my vision deteriorated. So by 17, sort of legally blind and I'd say mid-twenties, I was then at the point where I lost functional vision. So, you know, that means can't see faces or read or edge detection or anything, uh, anything like that anymore. But I've always been a big fan of technology. I'd say uh, that's where my sort of strengths lay, my sort of degrees in computational neuroscience and so my master's is uh, it's machine learning. But I somehow got mixed up in the world of ultra running. And that was just a, a bit of an accident. And it was thanks to the technology, really. It was quite a few years ago now, but it was when RunKeeper, uh, an app on the iPhone was first released. It was the first app to give information through audio. So you know, no reliance on looking at the screen now. I could just get audio updates of how far I'd run and, and things like that. So that's when I decided to see if I could train alone. So initially, I trained alone on a football pitch by just running up and down a football pitch. I then quickly transitioned to running on a closed road. So it was blocked at both ends. So I just used to feel the double yellow lines underfoot, run the, run the double yellow lines. And that's when I decided to see if I could match what it felt like underfoot to the distance markers on RunKeeper. And then I sort of started running on the open road by memorizing the uh, routes. And around that time, then I think I'd managed to run 10 miles. And before I knew it, 10 miles turned into 20, 30 miles in training. So then I saw uh, from my first ever race, I entered a hundred mile uh, race in the Cotswolds. hundred miles. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, in that particular race, I didn't actually make it to the end. Uh, I'd only been running like six months and after 83 miles, my legs were legs were ruined. So didn't quite get to the end on that on that race. But after after that sort of one race, I continued to compete at bigger distances. I peaked at sort of 260 miles uh, for a multi-day. I ran from Boston uh, to New York, and then once I got to New York, I ran the the New York Marathon. So that's back when I was really a lot fitter than I am uh, I am nowadays. That's for sure. But after I'd sort of managed to do all these things training solo, I really wanted to see if I could compete solo. And competing solo is a huge challenge. You know, traditionally you would use a guide runner. Um, but I thought, I wonder if we can work on, you know, some technology. So really fortunate at that point in time, I managed to partner with IBM. And we created this new type of navigation that the concept was of virtual corridors. So you could create a virtual corridor within physical space. Um, so that virtual corridor could be any shape, you know, it, you'd set the width. And what it would do is as soon as you leave the virtual corridor, you would be notified to drop back in to the corridor. So it would basically bounce you around inside this corridor and this corridor could essentially navigate you anywhere that you wanted to go. So for my first ever sort of solo race, I uh, headed over to Namibia in, uh, in South Africa with the intention to run across the Namibian desert just using, uh, using this technology. But, you know, things, things rarely go to plan. And uh, <laughs> while in the desert, I managed to injure myself a few times. Uh, one of the notable accidents was me running into a flagpole because I'd wrongly assumed no obstacles in the desert. But I managed to run into a flagpole and... Uh, hurt myself a little bit and then uh, the following day uh, while trying to navigate a rock field I tore the muscle that connects um, the IT band on your lower leg so I lost lateral movement in my in my left leg so I was heavily injured in that race so I think 
unaided, I covered around 90-ish miles competing solo, which you know is obviously you know a fantastic achievement to, to cover those distances solo. So then after I'd created that system for the desert, uh, I sort of return home and then I'm involved in, uh, in quite a bad accident. And it was when I was out training so well, um, someone had left a burnt out car on the pavement. I obviously, you know, did not see it. So I ran straight into it. It went into my shin, it went into my knee and it sliced around my knee and opened my knee up. And then you instinctively put your arms out. So I put my arms out and it went into my right arm and sliced the, uh, all the way down my right arm. So now I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe we need to look at creating some more technology to really tidy up uh, the corridor navigation and uh, the object navigation. So that's when I teamed up with a company out in America called Wearworks, and they were working on a very similar virtual corridor-based navigation system. And that uses haptics to keep in the virtual corridor. And then we quickly sort of hacked together an object detection system, which was really, really, really simple. Cool. Just use like ultrasound and it would send out a signal. And if that signal comes back, then you know there's an obstacle uh, in front. Obviously the quicker the signal comes back, you know, the, the closer the object. So really crude, really simple, but essentially quite effective because all I really need to know is, is there an obstacle currently in front? So that's the system I then used to compete in the New York City Marathon solo. And that system is now continuing to be developed by Wearworks because the system was never intended to be used as a running aid. It was more intended as a, a generalized navigational aid rather than, uh, rather than running. So yeah, during lockdown, obviously uh, taking significant shift in training. So the majority of training now is using a treadmill, which you know, as you can imagine, uh, introduce this huge sale because obviously I can't see the screen and things like that. So it's been a lot of using um, additional Bluetooth sensors. So then I'll, so I can sort of get all the information through audio. So whether that's sort of like my speed, my pace, the distance, heart rate. Now, every sort of 60 seconds, I get all that information. So it really gives me, I'd, I'd say sort of like the equivalent training that you would get if you're able, you know, to physically see the screen. So that's all my sort of running today, obviously more than happy to sort of go into detail on any of those particular elements or even, you know, say some of the exact technologies I've been using, but I think it might be more interesting if we perhaps to do a Q and A, if people have got any questions at all. Simon, hello, I'm Natalie, I'm the communications officer uh, for joining us. Um, I have a question. What would you say to, to people um, who are a bit nervous about running? Like what made you want to try and you know, break the mould? I think personally for me, um, as at a point in my life, like I said, you know, I was sort of mid-twenties where I perhaps hadn't adapted particularly well. I certainly wasn't using you know, assistive aids such as like a cane or a dog. And I thought I was coping really well, but essentially what I'd started doing was just putting my life on pause and not really learning new things. So then I really wanted to sort of break out of that rut. And like a year or so previous that, I'd read a book called Ultra Marathon Man by this guy called Dean Karnazes, who uh, runs unbelievable distances, like in the thousands of miles sort of uh, distances. So I thought to myself, well, you know, it, it, if this is humanly possible, perhaps all I need to do is, is slightly adapt it. And, you know, I could learn to do these things too. So it was more of a case of just recognizing that, you know, I had put my life on pause because of my, uh, my blindness and really wanting to do something different. Thank you. So Simon, when somebody says to you, um, you can't do that because you're blind, does that give you more of an incentive to go out there and, and do it? Because I've, I've had that myself where people say, oh, you can't do that because you're blind. And I, it really gives me the incentive to go out there and, and prove them wrong sort of thing. Absolutely. I still get that all the time. You know, in the past two years uh, during job interviews, people have said to my face, you know, the reason I'm not going to employ you is because you're blind. I'm like, well, 
you're not really allowed to say that. That's, uh, <laughs> you know, you're not allowed to say that. Uh, but yeah, like you more than anything, it sort of drove me to prove that, you know, these things are actually possible. And, you know, this September, I'm, I'm starting to teach computer science in secondary schools, which, you know, is a, for me personally, you know, is a real big step. Um, a lot of things I need to learn, a lot of ways I need to adapt. So I say someone tell me I can't do something generally does spur me to think of a way that these things can be done. Okay, thank you. That's great. It's, it's the sort of thing that comes across me as well. If people say to me, you can't do that because you're blind, then I'll, I'll give it the best go I can to do it. If I can't do it, then I'll hold my hands up and say, well, fair enough, you're right. But that's a very yeah, I think, so unfortunately, often people say that because, you know, they're generally sighted. And they imagine it's like closing their eyes and then they can't even believe it's possible to do these things. But often for, for a lot of the community, you know, we've grown up adapting with our lack of vision. So we've learned to do things in a very different way. So I think it's more to do with their lack of imagination rather than whether things are actually possible or not. Yeah, it's great because I know one of the, the activities that we do normally under normal conditions, we would have a, a driving day once or twice a year. Oh, wow. And we <laughs> give visually impaired people a chance to drive around a racetrack. So you can imagine when we, we first came up with the idea and we said, especially when we went to try and find insurance, I said, right, we've got this idea. <laughs> we've, got, we've got people going around a racetrack that are blind and sort of thing. And then the insurance people saying, what do you mean? Racetrack, blind people, cars. And so <laughs> it was a big no-no, but that is a hugely popular um, event that we put on. Yeah, well, I, I'm a huge fan of cars. Actually, one of the sports I follow really closely is actually F1. Big fan of, uh, big fan of that sport. Right, well, when we get round to, um, I think Rachel will probably back me up here, when we get round to uh, putting another driving day on, we'll invite you along, you come along as one of our guests. Oh, well, well, well yeah, that'd, that'd be cool. I'll, uh... You're my first one too, Simon, so I'm looking forward I, to it. I, well, I've never even, I've never, because I'm legal band at 17, I never even got to the age, you know, to drive a car. So I can probably, yeah, I used to be able to drive a car in Sega Rally, but I don't know how well <laughs> I do necessarily uh, in a real oh, car. Day, Sega Rally was epic. Oh, Sega Rally was great. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, I've got a question, well. Simon, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I wonder yeah. if you could tell me um, what your favourite marathon or the favourite run that you've ever done. Oh, favourite marathon, New York. Is um, it? Yeah, New York. If you're only ever going to do one marathon, it needs to be New York. Just the levels of crowd support at the entire event is you know, absolutely fantastic. I've been really lucky. I've run some of the majors, you know, so I've done London, I've done Boston, Boston obviously mm -hmm. being uh, quite the rarity with it being a qualifier. Um, yeah. LA, oh gosh, where else? I can't remember where else. But anyway, but yeah, New York is definitely my favorite marathon, but I would say my favorite run that I've ever done is a, when I ran from Boston to New York. Yeah, I was just reading about this in your bio, Simon. This is incredible. Yeah, I, I think it was just the fact it was something different, you know, because it wasn't necessarily like an organised race. Lots of people, you know, were running. What we did is just uh, use social media. And if you happen to live nearby, you know, you could come and be a guide and, and help me run between the two cities. So because of that, you know, just got to meet lots of different people. Um, I think gosh, around 200 people maybe came out in total between the, between the two cities. Some of those people today is still you know quite good friends so that's like what six years later still friends with these people so yeah that was really Amazing. really cool but to be honest after saying all of that the things i enjoy doing the most are local races so you know just really local to where i live i live in doncaster so i really enjoy things like the doncaster half marathon the sheffield half marathon just because the local it's fun you know yeah because i've got young kids so, you know, the family can come along, whereas, you know, the family don't really come along to say hello when you're in the middle of a desert or, you know, at the other side of the world. So it's nice to do something local. Um, I've got a question. Okay. If... Oh. oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. A lady's first. <laughs> oh, that's very kind of you. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I had a question for you, Simon, about, um, well, a couple of things, really, the technology and um, also 
So I was really interested, cause, so I'm, I'm blind, completely blind, and I run with a guide. Um, but the idea of running more solo is really appealing. Um, but the, like, I saw, foresaw your accident coming when you talked about the corridor navigation, because obviously, if you don't have really good object recognition alongside it, you can be running in a straight line with a bit of variation, but you could run into stuff in front of you. So how um, reliable do you think the technology is now? And in the New York Marathon, if you're running solo, um, obviously there must have been loads of people. So is it, is it enable, does it enable you to kind of avoid moving people? Or would you say that if you can't see anything, there's some extra challenges or? Um, okay, to address the technology question, I would say object detection, we are not too far away from being able to use quite portable LIDAR systems. Um, so it sounds like you know a lot about technology. So I don't know that much, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, for example, the new iPad Pro has a LIDAR sensor in the rear camera. So what that does, it basically fires out like a, a grid so it can do really accurate depth perception. So it knows exactly where all the obstacles are you know, in any given scene. Uh, so the rumor is that that's going to be on the latest iPhone. So you know this year's uh, this year's iPhone. So then, if we you know if we look one two years ahead, those lidars are going to get smaller and more portable. And then all of a sudden, we have an incredibly accurate object detection system because the system I used uh, for the marathon, I would say, incredibly high risk. Um, you need to be willing to accept the fact it is going to go wrong because yeah. you know at that point in time lidar was around 10 to twenty thousand dollars a sensor whereas you know i just mentioned now they're starting to put them in phones you know so you can see just how quick those things move mm -hmm. forward and i think for object detection that's going to be the real big breakthrough and it is just on the horizon and, and that's something that's really exciting so with that level of detail, then avoiding a lot of obstacles in a tight space, you basically come down to then to how do you communicate that to the blind person? Yeah. Um, and that's, I would say, where the real challenge is. It's not necessarily detecting those things. It's how can you quickly and effectively communicate essentially how to avoid the obstacle. That's, you know, that's really key. And I think that's the problem that, you know, we need to be focusing on. And what, that's something that I know a few companies do look at. And it's like, how do you do it? Do you use haptic? Do you use audio? You know, what's quicker? So hopefully there's a lot more research around that. And I think it's going to be really interesting in the next couple of years. I really do. So right now, you'd need to be willing to super high risk in a couple of years' time. I'd imagine we're just downloading that from the App Store and uh, we can start avoiding things. Yeah, so when you were running in the New York Marathon, then um, did you find that you had a, a lot of accidents sort of tripping over curves or walking, walking into people? Or did you find you were able to kind no. of use the corridors yeah. and object recognition well? One of the interesting things, to, well, I actually ran that race just using the object detection. Um, but you need to think, do you know when you're running a race like New York, um, it's actually on the road, so there's no curbs because you're running where the road, uh, the cars would traditionally be. Yeah. So the number of obstacles in terms of trip hazards is minimal there's just it's non-existent because you know they don't make cars drive over curbs it's uh, makes it a lot easier so there's no real trip hazard so that's kind of written out of the equation and then in terms of how many other people um again that's quite an interesting artifact of how a race you know plays out um so at the start of the race of course it's quite compact isn't it so you know lots of people all around so then basically what you're doing is um the vibration is mapped to so the higher the sort of vibration the closer the object the lower the vibration you know the further the object is away so then you can get a sense of right if i lock that sort of in the middle then i know that i'm giving myself like two meters to the person in front and, and that's how i used that system and it takes around because new york's weird because there's multiple routes that all end up merging together um so by mile seven, you know, it sort of thins out, so to speak, and then it gets really busy again. So you flick between using the vibration to know there's someone there and following them 
to then using the vibration to make sure you're avoiding them when it's a, a bit thinner of people. Thanks. Would anyone mind if I just ask one more question? Sorry. <laughs> Just it was just about the when you're running on a treadmill. I'm sure there are yeah. loads of people who would be interested in knowing what um, technology you use to hear the audio feedback for your running speed yeah. and distance and stuff. Do you know what, a, a, a friend sent me a link just the other day to this new one that just came out? And, oh my god, I want it. It's even better than what I've currently got right now. It's like I think it's about seventy pounds. It's incredible. But I'll tell you what I use now, and then I'll move on to move on to that one. Right. So right now I use a Bluetooth foot pod. You know, so I just have that on the laces of, uh, of my shoe. And then I also have a Bluetooth heart rate sensor. Um, so the heart rate sensor is made by a company called Wahoo. So that's W-A-H-O-O. -O. I think they're probably around £40 for that sensor. Uh, the foot pod, I believe that company got bought out. And so we got renamed to the Swift foot pod. And I think that's about 20 or £30. Um, so then both those sensors tie into an app called Wahoo Fitness. So again, W-A-H-O-O -O, Fitness. Uh, that's a free app. And what you can do on Wahoo is really, really cool. You can create these like, uh, you say for this activity, so our activity is treadmill. When I'm on the treadmill, every like one minute, two minutes, three minutes, this is the audio I want to hear. And you can select everything from like current pace, average pace, current heart rate, average heart rate distances, you name it, cadence, whatever. And then you can choose what interval and you can get really detailed. So for example, you could say that every one minute, I want my heart rate. And then every mile, I want distance and um, average pace. So you can have both those running, you know, along side by side. So you can actually end up building quite a detailed, almost sort of training partner of knowing exactly how you're doing. So that's why I currently use. Um, but there's a sensor you can get now and it's um, an optical sensor. So you put it on the edge of the treadmill and there's uh, two little optical sensors. So you basically put two little stickers on your treadmill or you know, use some Tipex. And then what it does, it times um, how long it takes to flick between the two optical sensors. And then that ties in you know, to the Wahoo Fitness app again. And it gives you a super, super accurate um, speed, pace, and distance and that is called the NPE run but run is two n's so r u n n and uh, yeah like i say that's around 70 75 pounds that one thanks a lot hey can i ask <laughs> yep hi hi simon uh, it's andrew hi. so i work for galloways i'm our assistant technology coordinator um, now I, I currently use a treadmill myself. I just use the Apple Watch, um, which is yeah. my indoor run. But I really like the idea of what you're talking about there. Um, you probably, you know, that's probably going to encourage me now to go and spend more money on something else. <laughs> well, thankfully, you know, the sense of, you know, when you look at assistive tech for thirty yeah. pounds, the sense is pretty cheap. <laughs> yeah, usually, we're spending uh, add a couple of zeros on that. And that voice feedback is that coming through your smartphone from the app essentially yep. oh, okay yep. so um i keep on saying i'm going to do this upgrade but i haven't done this upgrade yet i keep on meaning because i've got an iphone i keep on meaning to buy have you seen the uh the sonos speaker you can get from ikea um no like, i'm not seeing, i'm not seeing i know a sonos but i've not seen the particular yeah so ikea sell a really cheap sonos speaker that supports airplay so okay. I keep on meaning to buy uh, that so I can yeah. just pipe, uh, pipe it through AirPlay. But right now, I flip between either wearing you know, a pair of Bluetooth headphones or just, to be honest, balancing the phone and listening to it through the phone. Yeah, yeah. No, look, it sounds like a really good way. And there's obviously, if you've got a treadmill with speakers in it, you could also maybe use the yeah, audio. Yeah, phone yeah you could pipe it through, uh, through the treadmill. Because, yeah. to be honest, I've, I've got, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but you've heard of Techno Gym? The gym equipment yeah 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 so i've got a techno gym my run so you can actually control the entire treadmill through the iphone you know speed and everything yeah um which sounds like really cool but to be honest it's so much simpler just to use all these sensors than it is to mess around when you're running trying to change everything through your phone because yeah. you know when you're training on the treadmill you're usually tired and sweaty aren't you so yeah. <laughs> having it all automated is actually uh I use that more than I do the fact I've got an accessible treadmill. And I think, you know, um, just talking about LiDAR sensors there, 
Um, I think the rumours are really strong about the LiDAR sensors. I mean, they're already in the iPad Pro, um, so they are going to come to the phones. But even, yeah. more, even more interesting, which might interest you as well, is Apple Glass. So yeah. Apple's kind of um, head-worn system, which, you know, is not going to have a camera in it as such. It's mainly going to be a LiDAR sensor. So that might be something that you would wear. Um, and as you say, you know, the, the accuracy from the LiDAR sensor is going to help not just kind of for running, but knowing where the curves are, knowing where, you know, oh, where indoor navigation for me, yeah. you know, going into, well, this is, this seems quite early right now, but going into a Starbucks and being able to navigate to tables easily and stuff, yeah. you know, that, that's the thing that's going to enable indoor navigation. That can be quite tricky for somewhere, you know, you've never been to before. Yeah. Yeah. Cause obviously I'm sure many of us just go to, the place to memorize the layout, whereas not having to do that, yeah, I'm really looking forward to. But yeah, so I was just the light of evolution. Bit of an observation on that one, and, and and also, I mean, when you're, I mean, there's no there's no bones about it that when you're on a treadmill, uh, you do have to kind of train your your mental mind to get used to doing that on your own on a treadmill. It's more mechanical. What do you, what are you, what are your tunes? What's your playlist? And I just um, motivated. To be honest. I just use the radio, listen to Radio 1. Um, but then lot, <laughs> I use lots of then like tactics to keep myself pushing forward. Yeah. So I personally break everything into five minute blocks. Um, so every five minutes I'll have a sip of my drink and then I count down in tens. You know, so let's say I'm running for 60 minutes. I'll count down like 50, 40, 30, 20, da, da, da. And then as silly as it sounds, I actually give myself a little round of applause every 10 minutes, you know, just as like a, a bit of a pick me up. Yeah. And I find then you're always just waiting for the next five minutes. And then it doesn't seem uh, too bad to do that. Whereas I often think, um, you know, if you don't have that going on, it's harder. But what I will say is, you know, just having those audio announcements every minute yeah. actually makes treadmill training a lot easier. Cause I've trained, you know, years ago when, you know, you couldn't, I couldn't see the screen at all. So you've got no real sense of how far you've gone or your progress. And that's really demotivating. Yeah. Absolutely. So the fact that every minute you get an update of how much further you've gone, you're like, oh, yeah, gosh, I've just run like 4.3 miles. So it's really nice to get that, you know, one minute. But that's, to be honest, that's why I set it so often as one minute. So then every minute, you know, getting the update of how far I've gone and, I just feel like it keeps me more motivated to know how far I've gone or how far Absolutely. I've got left. It's like your guide runner with you. If you had a guide runner, for example, and they were telling you where you were, isn't it, as well? So you're getting that feedback. Yeah. What would be great, Simon, if you, know, if you wouldn't mind passing um, that information or maybe an email to James, just that particular equipment that you're using there? Yeah, I think I, even, yeah, I, think I might have done a blog post with actual links to the actual products oh, themselves as well okay. on my website. Uh, oh, oh, brilliant. I, I haven't done one about that, you know, that treadmill sense because I, I haven't managed to get hold of that treadmill sense yet. Yeah. Um, but as soon as I do, I'll definitely because I was so excited when my friend said, like, I did not know this existed. This is this yeah. is brilliant. I can you I can wear any <laughs> pair of shoes I want now rather than having to wear the pair of the shoes with a sensor on. You know, now I can just uh yeah. could you use it with an exercise bike as well? Is it uh, now, to... right? I did actually come up with a setup for an exercise bike. So again, I was using because Wahoo was a company basically make um, a lot of Bluetooth sensors for lots of different things. And if you really want to splash the cash, they do some really high-end accessible exercise bikes as well. But what I did is I bought a really cheap spin bike from Amazon. I think it was maybe like 180 pounds or something. You know, it wasn't crazy expensive. So then a spin bike has, you know, the flywheel at the front. So then what I did is I bought a Wahoo do a kit that you can attach to, you know, a standard road bike. So then I duct tape the sensors to the flywheel. So every time the flywheel rotate around, it trigger and classes one rotation. And then what you do is you basically measure the, uh, the diameter of the flywheel. You punch that into Wahoo and then it can get an accurate sense of distance of how far, you know, you, you spun the flywheel around. And then you also get a sensor that you put on the stem of your pedals so then you get your cadence so now i have cadence speed and, and distance and then you know a heart rate sensor as well and then you've got all the information you'd need for an exercise bike but you are going to need an exercise bike that, that has a flywheel which is why i use the spin bike 
could be an element of this as well, Simon. Um, you know, we talk about people going to the local gym and going to the local leisure centre. There's, there's an element of making gym equipment kind of more accessible because it simply isn't. And, you it's know, not. You know, you it's go not. to a lot of gyms with touch screens and things like that. And um, maybe, you know, you guys out there uh, on the meeting today, you know, if you go to a local gym somewhere, let's, go, let's talk to our gyms about this type of equipment as well um, to try and make stuff more accessible. Uh, well, you know? that, that setup that I mentioned, I can't use on the treadmill, of course, that will work anyway because obviously you're wearing yeah. the sensors, just mm -hmm. the optical one. You'd. But weirdly, uh, that sensor that North Pole Engineering make, in America, North Pole Engineering, that's where they make all their money. They actually... Um, install these in gyms um but for some reason they just don't seem to have traction in the uk but in, yeah in america that's how they make all their money they go to gyms and professionally fit all these things on uh, on the equipment fascinating brilliant stuff mate thank you cool. simon it's james again um the, the the sensors you said you fitted to the spin bike yep. if they were fitted at a gym you know sort of on the flywheel and on the the pedal crank would hmm. a visually impaired person, if they went to use that equipment, would they be able to log into those? Um, I think the issue with the spin bike is uh, when I say I stuck it on, I like stuck it on with duct tape. <laughs> it was quite a hacky approach. I don't know if the gym would be too happy about that. Um, no, but, I was just thinking with, with the sensors, if there was a way they could do it, sort of oh, more professional for the gym and that it was on a particular bike and stayed yeah. on that bike so and north pole engineering support. who make you know the optical sense for the treadmill like say in america that is what they do that's how they make their money they do actually fit these things to the gym equipment so people can get the data off so it is something that happens for some reason it just has no penetration in in uk and I'm guessing if you down, if you had the Wahoo app and you went to that gym and it's a free app, you just go on that bike, it's all installed, and then you tell it what the the measurement yeah. of that flywheel is. So you'd need to know that, I guess, from the gym staff, and then off you go. Is that right? Um, well, to be honest, if it was already professionally fitted at the gym, that'd probably already be done for you. You know, you just say that, you know, they'd probably called it. Because all the sensors have come up and, you know, they've probably been lists like spin bike one, two, three, four, five, whatever, do you know what I mean? So, if you want spin back five, you just tap spin back five and you connect to that sensor. I see. So basically, yeah. So you, you would know, um, you would just be able to turn up to your gym, have the right app and you could go if it was all installed for you. Should be yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. But like I say, for some reason, that's never happened in the UK. I, d I don't understand the commercial gym arena to understand why, <laughs> but it, it's yeah, just, it's just it never happened, so simple unfortunately. It, it does. And uh, it's actually, you know, the gyms in America like it because then, you know, they've got real time data of what's being used. And, you know, let's say I'm making this up, don't quote me on this, but maybe you need us to service the treadmill every like thousand miles. So then you've got a piece of software then that tracks every treadmill in your gym and sends you a notification. Go and check out treadmill 12, you know. But I've, on, I've got no idea why it's never really made it over to this side of the uh, side of the world. But like I do say, that treadmill cell that I've got will work on any treadmill you choose to use ever. So that's a great way to make that accessible. And um, the bike, if you had a heart rate sensor, you could fit the, um, uh, the sensor, you know, to get how, how much you're pedaling. And with heart rate and that, to be honest, you could probably figure out uh, the rest of it anyway, you know, because obviously your heart rate's going to give you that effort element of training, which is often the most important element anyway. So when, when you, going back to when you were training near the airport and you, you ran into the burnt out car, what yep. did that do to your confidence? Did, did you suddenly think, oh, I'm going to pack this in, it's too dangerous? Or did you just pick yourself up and think, I'm going to... Oh, that's, that's a tough one to answer. Um, mentally, obviously, it was... Uh, I took quite a knock. It was hard and... I'd been doing this for years now, you know, going out and training there. And I do, like I said, I do have two children. And uh, I realised that if I don't go back out and do it now, you know, I'll never do it again. So it was probably, 
it didn't take too long to heal, to be honest. To be like, I can't remember you know, the exact time. And, uh, but I did go back out and do it a bit just to prove I could still do it, you know, because I didn't really want to never go back and uh, never be able to do it. But then equally, I was left in a position where, you know, it's obviously very high risk and I do have two young sons. And ooh, so then that was when I decided to start doing a lot more training with my guys and <laughs> doing a lot more treadmill training because uh, it certainly made it easier on the family rather than having to worry about me being seriously injured. I guess it was a bit like the old adage, when you learn to ride a bike, you fall off, you get back on it and... Yeah, once I'd proved myself that I'd still there do it, I started to reduce how much I did it just to just to stay safe because, yeah, I've got two young kids. Okay, has anybody else got any questions? Yeah, I've got one. Hi, it's Natalie again. Um, what's your next challenge going to be? Um, the next challenge is uh, teaching in the classroom and no doubt getting a lot of abuse from teenage kids. Uh, but in terms of sort of endurance, um, if I can stay fit enough, um, I think I'll probably do something at the ultra distance next year, uh, maybe next summer. Um, so that'll probably be multi-day. So maybe aim for like a uh, hundred, a hundred and fifty miles, something like that. Mm -hmm. But it's whether I can stay fit uh, through winter while working full time. That's, <laughs> that seems that, that seems really challenging to try and fit all of this in. But I'd I'd love to do some endurance stuff on a bike. Um, you know whether that be tandem or some other type of uh, other type of bike. Because I used to love riding my bike when I could see. So it's something that I do, I do still miss. Um, so I'd love to do like a five or a thousand mile endurance ride, but I don't know if anyone's ever seen the price of tandem bikes, they're quite expensive. So, <laughs> yeah, that, expensive, yeah. yeah, yeah, really expensive. So <laughs> that might be uh, a few years off, yeah. But yeah, so next year, probably do an ultra distance run, uh, longer term, I'd love to go on the bike. Wow, good luck with all this. That's one thing I started, I used to love riding the bike as well. and since I lost my sight, I, I've never been on a bike until last year we went out, me and my wife went out and bought, bought a couple of bikes. Yeah. And uh, because I do have a bit of vision, I just follow behind her with the high vis. She has a high vis jacket on and I follow behind her and we, we do a few things that way. Nothing extreme or anything like you guys have done, but it's just a great feeling to be out on a bike and be in control of something. Yeah. If, if you enjoy... I know this is very different, but if you enjoy like bike training, so I know people seem interested in that. Uh, Wahoo do actually sell uh, an exercise bike that's incredibly accessible. And also their entire Wahoo kicker range is accessible. And there's even a guy who publishes an app on the app store that works particularly well with voiceover for doing interval training with a kicker. So there's some really accessible fitness stuff out there. You've just got to buy into like this Bluetooth sensor sort of uh, world and then it opens up a lot of trading options. Very good. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. I can also advocate tandem in as well, because um, I've done some some tandem rides in the Dales and things. And um, so, yeah, if you if you're interested in that, then uh, tandem is a great way to stay on the bike and not worry about whether you're following well or not. And um, you can get some real good speed up. I know, I'd, I'd, lo I'd love to do it, I really would. It's Because uh, my wife always mentions about getting a tandem. I'm just thinking, I know you meant me do all the pedalling. I know, you know. <laughs> I think she just worked for doing the uh, navigation. I'd be doing a lot of pedalling. So what's your average training for the week, Sam? Um, so like I say, nowadays, uh, my training looks very, very different. So I try, I try and run six days a week. But I'm not really achieving that in a minute. So I think I'm, I would... Average five days a week, so through the week, so like Monday through Friday, uh, the short runs would be between like four and five, and then on the Sunday, uh, sort of between six and ten. So I should have been doing the math as I was going along there, but whatever that adds up to <laughs> uh, <laughs> is a uh, one. And then, uh, interestingly, in lockdown, 
I've switched to doing a lot of body weight uh, training. So, you know, things like pull-ups and dips and, and things like that. So I fitted a pull-up bar in, in the garage and bought myself a weighted vest. So, yeah, a lot of my training now is, uh, is body weight. To be honest, which has been really good because um, I used to enjoy, you know, doing weights, but I always then, like, needed a spotter or something to be there because you, you really don't want to really drop a weight on yourself when you're, you know, when you're lifting heavy or anything. Um, so the, the great thing about body weight training, of course, is uh, no weights. Uh, if it's too much, you just let go of the bar and you, you drop to the floor. So, yeah, five to six days a week running, three days a week body weight training. Simon, what treadmill do you use that's accessible? Uh, it is the Techno Gym My Run. Uh, it's expensive. I would not buy it. If I was you, I would buy uh, something from the Nordic Track range. A Nordic Track, if you look on the website, um, a number of their treadmills have something called the One Touch system. So what that means is on either side of the screen, there's some buttons, and just from one touch alone, it jumps it to that speed. I can't remember you know, what the speeds are. So one side speed and then one side is incline. But like I say, because it's one touch, it just jumps to that incline or jumps to that speed. So then what I did is I attached, uh, do you know those little bump on speed, uh, stickers? Yeah. Um, I attached those every like three. So then I could quickly just find the bump on and know I needed to be either one higher or one lower than the, the bump on. And that was really cool. Uh, that worked really well. Um, I think those treadmills range between sort of 800 and maybe 1300 pounds i think the techno gym my run is probably closer to 4000 so yeah i definitely recommend the nordic track over the, the techno gym hi simon it's liz i've been trying to ask a question for ages but i didn't realize i was muted oh right um, <laughs> i've been i've put my hand up but no one was watching <laughs> I <wanted to> <laughs> I would ask you about your nutrition. What do you eat um, during and before, like your long runs, and okay. what's your uh, main go-to meal sort of that you eat? Mainly Dunkin' Donuts and pizza. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm terrible <laughs> when it comes to nutrition. Um, when I'm training really hard, um, I try and eat as clean as possible. And I class eating clean is mm -hmm. basically just trying to avoid sugar. Um, you know, so goodbye to like biscuits and chocolate and desserts. Yeah. And I just try to eat well like that. Um, you know, it's not like I have a strict diet where in the morning I have exactly this and at lunch I have exactly this. I just try to be reasonably well balanced by cutting out the sugar things. But I will uh, hold my hands up and say, I do really enjoy going to Dunkin' Donuts. I do. <laughs> really enjoy uh pizza and i do enjoy we've got a local burger joint it's really good so <laughs> my I, I wouldn't necessarily follow my nutrition plan because it is rubbish uh, i love cake <laughs> well, well what, I, what i would say is i uh, you know run to eat rather than eat to run so i use running as a great way to go oh, up 900 calories that's six donuts. Uh, today's going to be a good day. <laughs> you know, that's uh, that's uh, what I do. That's the story I, of my life, Simon. That just yeah. just burning calories in order to eat them again. <laughs> yeah, I I do that as my that is, if you want to take fitness seriously, of course, or or, or be an athlete, that's not the way to do it. But no. if you want to be if you want to be able to eat donuts and ice cream, it's a great way to do it, and uh, not have to worry about not fitting in your jeans. So <laughs> yeah. That's get a treadmill, body. get a buy a tandem as well. I've got on the fab, honestly. I do a lot of tandem riding. Yeah, it's I'd like to have great fun, wife, honestly. I think at some you have point such a my, laugh. my wife will sort of uh, mm. bully me into eventually doing it. I, I would like to, I think maybe once the kids are a bit older, um, yeah. you know, so they can follow us on their bikes. Um, mm. Where's my youngest? <laughs> yeah, yeah, get a, get a car type one. Um, <laughs> so I think it, it'd just be hard on my youngest to sort of ride. Bigger disc. Although, to, having said that, my, my youngest is the better runner compared to my oldest. My youngest is uh, it's quite good at running. I know this isn't to do with running, but do you know of any accessible technology for swimming? Or... Oh, right. Okay. They never commercially released it, but Samsung did an accessible swimming hat. And right. the, way, the way it worked is, 
you, know, you put the sensors at either end of the pool and it vibrated when you got near the sensor. Yeah, right. And I was like, oh, why don't you release this? This is, this is brilliant. But although, to be honest, when I go swimming, my main issue is hitting all the other people in the pool. Yeah, that's mine. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not necessarily the wall because you count your strokes, don't you? You yeah, know, you know yeah. that it's like whatever how many it is. How long? It's, yeah. Yeah, it's for yourself. Whereas other people, uh, yeah. no, I used to hit them up. So in the end, what I did is um, I found a company. There's lots of these companies. Um, you know, that print swim caps for like swimming clubs. Mm. Yeah. And I got them to print some swim caps that in big layers just said blind. <laughs> so yeah. whenever I went swimming, I just wore my swim cap that said blind in the hopes <laughs> that people would stay out of my way. Yeah. So that, that could be something to try. But in terms mm-hmm. of technology, Samsung made it, but they never released it as a commercial product, which was a, a real shame. But yeah. I think someone I'm made a- some goggles, didn't they? That, uh-huh. I'd like a heads up display in. So maybe uh-huh. if you have a look around, maybe there's some right. way that, that heads up display could give you the information, yeah. you know, in a different different form. I've had yeah. a lot of success with the Apple Watch, but um it's not gonna because it's kind of visual once you go in the pool, you you know, you can't use voiceover on the watch. But yeah. it will um it you can set goals on the watch and it will give you tactic feedback mm. when you're finished and I'm, I'm midway. Um, and then you get all the data afterwards. So, you know, yeah, I've had quite a bit of success with the Apple Watch swimming. Is that Apple Watch good then? What series have you got? Because I was looking at getting one, but I wasn't sure. Got there series, a lot of money. Got, yeah, got Series 5. Um, oh. Doing some demonstrations of it next week on our uh, our technology event. All right. Um, and, yeah, you know, uh, uh, probably you probably agree. Probably, Simon, you know, a yeah. smartwatch is a is a good affordable way to get into a bit of you know tech for you know kind of to be know. honest um the thing i love my because i've got an apple watch um i turned on do you know the 15 minute chirp uh, oh thing? yeah 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 so in 15 minutes i get a little birds i just like that, love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's actually really handy like ooh. Bird chirp, right? Okay, yeah. I'm doing this 15 minutes. <laughs> that, <laughs> and does that, that work? That, Sounds silly, but it's actually yeah, quite useful. <laughs> I think, I think it's it... underestimated, isn't it? You know, the smartwatch really, because a lot a lot of people don't probably realise mm. that you know the, the, the Apple Watch, especially Apple Watch with voiceover, is completely accessible, and you've got the the fitness apps and some third party ones as well. So yeah, it's just great for no- notifications. Yeah, you know, um, sometimes at a pinch, if I can't find my phone, I'm a call because yeah. you know watches on my wrist. I can't remember where I put my phone. So. <laughs> Does it work on the treadmill? Because I was my, yeah. one of my questions was going to be about, um, I run on the treadmill quite a lot, but I, mm. don't, I can't see the screen like you say, and I haven't mm. got anything that tracks what I've run and how fast, um, like you say, I it is say demoralizing. So it, It's not as accurate as those sensors that I mentioned. Uh, yeah. And um, you don't get that real refined, or you know, where you can fine tune exactly what's going to come through on the audio. Okay. You know, because you can, like, on the Wahoo stuff, you can get the information that's important to you because right. you might find that you train better if you know your cadence yeah, or your heart rate or whatever. So yeah. I'd say the phone, you can really go into, like, granular detail, whereas the watch, don't get me wrong, I do still track it on the yeah. watch as well as on the phone at the same time, you know, just... Yeah. You can. <laughs> but, I've, not, um, I've not heard of that Wahoo. I'm going to have a look. I'm going to have a look oh, it's, it's, that Honestly, Wahoo. it's, it's yeah. really... Really First time good. I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, the, the sensors are relatively cheap on uh, on Amazon as well. To uh, if you do, if you do a treadmill run with your Apple Watch, make sure you pick uh, indoor run. Right. I think Huawei have so. got a uh, they've got a beta thing on their health app for um, treadmill running, which is supposed to. Who be do? I've tried it, but I've not tried it yet. So who's that on? Sorry. Uh, Huawei, or who are oh. we, or however you say, <laughs> however you say. Right. yeah, on their, their health app, they've got a, a, a sort of a beta version um, for yeah. indoor running on treadmills. Right. You could, all, you could always start with the sensors because it's you know, a cheaper entry point, yeah. and then uh, wait till the Series 6 Apple Watch comes out, and then the 5 will be cheaper. Yeah, <laughs> good plan. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. I'll just, I'll just, I'll, 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 I'll show up now, but I'll just say one last thing. I'll, I'll beeline that one and say that if you want any more advice about 
Apple Watch and things like that. Come and speak oh, to you. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> what day is that on? Tuesday. 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 Yeah, Tuesday. So Simon, do you prefer running with a guide or on your own, which is, which is the best? Um, and do you use a tether? Do you use a tether when you're with a guide? How do you run with a guide? I think nowadays I enjoy running with a guide for the company. Um, yeah, Because yeah. we run again. Going to drop in another Dunkin' reference, but we run to Dunkin'. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I do running as like a social thing, you know, just to get to yeah. see my friends and stuff. Because you know they've got families, so. It's easy to say that you're going for an hour run than it is to say I'm going to see my mate for an hour. You know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that's more perhaps accepted. So, yeah, I see it as like a real social thing. You know, a lot yeah. of the bases I go to are for, for being social. And you do the park runs? Do you do the park uh, runs? My particular park run is not a very enjoyable course, it's to be nice. honest with you. No, there's this bit where you loop around and it's real marshy. Uh -huh. um, so you just really sink and just makes it not fun which is a real yeah. shame um yeah. but I, don't get me wrong you know if a few of my friends said they're going yeah. down then absolutely i go down and do it because it, it's great again the, mm. the social aspect in terms of tethering uh, no i don't you know physically hold a tether what i will do is we'll run side by side and then you know if i'm um, need a bit of support then i'll just you know like grab onto an elbow or, or whatever but we run a lot of the same routes, you know, so I'm really comfortable in use of those routes. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't feel, you know, a need to sort of tether on those routes. But when it's somewhere totally brand new, yeah, sometimes it can be more, be more nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. So I'll, uh, I'll hold on. I, I live in Scarborough and one of our runs is um, along the cliff top. And yep. um, no, but no one will guide me along there because they're all worried I'm going to fall ah. off the edge. <laughs> well, you've got that night because... Uh, my wife's family live in Scarborough. There's that really wide yeah. path along the seafront. So, I've just run yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, no one, will, no one will take me along. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, if anyone's interested, um, I found a way of running socially distanced during lockdown, where oh. I'm holding on to with like a two meter long kind of piece of little, little plastic piping. Um, oh, that's a good idea. So um, or, instead of being side by side, you're one behind the other. Um, and it's a rigid stick so you feel the movement of the person front pretty easily um yeah. and it's just next to you so it it kind of it it's kind of enabled me to to run again because obviously at the minute Brit, um guides are saying they're worried about running not socially distanced in england athletics are putting out lots of stuff saying like you can't be tethered to your guide because it's too close and stuff so i, I found mm. that works for me in a park um, yeah, I, tr I tried something similar. I took one of our service users on a walk last week uh, and just to to try it, we uh, used the white cane, sort of. I was held on one end of the white cane and he was on the other. Yeah. And that seemed to work to a, a certain degree. It's not, not foolproof or anything, but to a certain degree, you could probably get around it. Yeah, I've, I've done that with hiking poles on trail, you know, just because you've got it on you. And it's a, it's a great way, great yeah, great way to do it. Social distance because me and my friend were actually looking around this conversation the day. Are we allowed to run now? And we're not too sure what the uh, what the so rules are. Official on. guidance is that um, for if you're like talking about England athletics, they're saying to guides um, you can't run um, with VI if you're tethered together. But yeah. they're not really taking into account the fact that there might be ways of doing it. So, for example, if you could follow someone by the sound of their feet or like yeah. you're doing running sort of near them but not you know maybe or or with something that's two meters or longer then yeah that that can't be that can't be a problem surely so no well hopefully i'll uh, i'll get back in well actually wait i'm going to see my one of my main guide runners next week so we'll probably uh go out and do some run one thing we tried as well a few years ago, we, a few of us did uh, Hadrian's Wall. We walked Hadrian's Wall, and one of the guys there who was totally blind, he, he had a guide dog, but he didn't take the guide dog on the, the walk. But what he did for some sections was he clipped the guide dog's handle to the back of a backpack. Oh, right. Section, so that, that worked really well for him. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, that's a good idea. Thank you so much on behalf of, of, of Galloway's. Um, I'm sure James, I want to thank you, but this is my first time on these calls, so thanks very much. 
Oh no, it's it's great to come along. And I always enjoy doing more of a like a, a Q and A rather than me sitting here and talking for forty minutes. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> yeah, thanks thanks a lot, sir. It's been it's been really good. And like I say, re- reading the things that you've done, uh, it's just been amazing and big inspiration for anybody else that's out there. So yeah, thanks a lot for coming along. Oh no, worries. thank you. It's my pleasure. Cheers, guys. Thank you, thank you Simon. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Galloway's support through sight loss.